Um, everybody, welcome to the Partnership for International Birding video conference on Peru bird watching um, with Jose Antonio Padilla. Today, we're going to focus on um, birding along the Manu Road into the Amazon Basin. And then, if we have time, we're going to talk about birding um, on the Machu Picchu extension. Um, and uh, it is a 600 species tour, so um, we only are going to show about two to four birds for each site. Jose Antonio is going to talk about, going to start with his six favorite sites along the way. And um, and there you go. Before I, I do a quick introduction to Jose Antonio, um, I just want to take a few minutes to, la to lay down the ground rules for, for the call. Um, truly, we want to keep everyone participating as much as possible. We want to keep the conference and discussion moving along. Um, we have found that the open microphone policy works well, as long as there's not a lot of back background noise. Um, there are going to be some presentation parts. So try not to interrupt Jose and Antonio. But truly, we're going to take a little break after each sort of major bird, bird watching site to ask some questions. Feel free to jump in. And if you feel like nobody's hearing you, um, feel free to text your quest question and we'd love to have it. Um, so um, just the, I guess I've sort of given a quick agenda for the day, so I won't take more time with that. I will introduce Jose Antonio, who I've known, golly geez, for probably a decade plus. Um, he grew up in Lima, Peru. He has been living in Cusco for quite a while. Um, he's been a bird guide in Peru for nearly 20 years, starting as a bird guide in the Amazon Basin, um, expanded his birding to include the Manu Road. Um, in recent years, he's also learned to bird in, in northern Peru and other parts of South America. Um, but Peru is his home, his backyard, and truly other bird, bird guides really appreciate him. And our, our clients love his friendly and casual style. Um, he's truly always willing to help. I've truly talked to him at 10 o'clock at night and he was doing laundry for a hardcore British birding group. And I'm like, dude, man, they've got to learn to do their own laundry. That's a big ask. But he truly, he'll do whatever you ask him to do. He's a very nice man. Um, and his expertise in uh, birding and tour logistics and his warm personality will just make him a great choice for your birding tour leader in Peru. With no further ado, I give you Jose Antonio Petia Rea. So, my friend. <laughs> thank you, Charles. Thank you, everybody, for joining me this afternoon. Um, thanks for the introduction as well. Um, yeah, time passed really fast, ne, Charles? It's been almost <laughs> a, one decade since we've been working together. But anyways, well. yeah, so it's been a long time now, but it doesn't look like it anyways. So thanks again. Um, I've been doing this for more than 15, 18 years, folks. Um, this is a, pre a presentation I made for you. Peru is a big country, all right? It's a country with the second highest pop uh, number of species of birds in the world after Colombia. So I try to put as much information as I can in this presentation, and um, but I will be focusing in southern eastern Peru, in the destination, I mean, in Manu National Park or Bio Biosphere Reserve, Machu Picchu, and an area nearby called Malaga Pass. So let's um, uh, first uh, be in context about where Peru is located. Well, I think everybody knows where Peru is. Let, let me just give, okay. So here is Peru in South America, folks. Uh, Peru is, of course, a big country, as I said. It's the third largest country in South America. We have more than 33 million inhabitants, all right? Lima, the capital. Hey, I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing your screen. I've got, I've got your image. Are other people getting your screen? Mm -hmm. See, si? is it my yeah, presentation? See, si? uh, okay. I see this so, screen and your face, so I have no okay, okay, good, 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 good. It must be me. All right, I'll figure it out. Thanks, guys. 
Okay. Go ahead, my friend. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. So as I said, uh, Peru uh, has more than 33 million inhabitants. All right. It's a big population we have here. Peru is also um, the country with the second highest number of birds in the world. As I said, we have now 1,846 species of birds, which is a lot, of course. And uh, so, you know, recently, about a month ago or something, um, there's been a big split from the Rufus anpita, uh, which used to be one species, and now there are about 10 species. Uh, and out of these 10 species, eight new species are endemic to Peru. So that means we have to add eight more species to this uh, 1,846 species now. All right. So uh, the capital of Peru, as you probably know, is Lima. And um, Lima is a big city. We have more than 12 million inhabitants living in Lima now. And as you can see here in the presentation, Lima is the only capital city in South America in front of the sea, in front of the ocean. So that will give you the chance for a short birding around, all right, to get some specialties just by, you know, just by, by the city, um, like Inca terns, Peruvian pelicans, humbo penguin, which is a, a species of penguin um, that is endemic to the humbo current that we have here in Peru, that we can be seeing easily, right? in a very short time, all right? If you have the time to do that before we go and fly into Cusco, which will be the next city where we need to go in order to start the tour to Manu, okay? So here are some pictures of the birds we are likely to see. We do have a chance and a little time in Lima. It's not that far, it's very close. And then we can get to see all these birds. So Peru, just to make it simple, folks, it's a country that has three main regions, all right? Peru have much more than that. But just to make it short and simple, here in this map, we can see the main three regions that we have in Peru. We have the coast, as you can see here, which is in actually desert, all right? We also have beautiful beaches and some fertile valleys. We have, in fact, 28 rivers that are coming from the Andes and will flow into the Atlantic, sorry, into the Pacific Ocean here. Um, the coast of Peru is basically a uh, distinction of the Atacama Desert that comes from Chile, which is supposed to be the driest desert in the world. So meaning that Lima, the capital, and some of the big cities we have on the coast are actually in the middle of the desert, all right? So then we have this brown part in the middle of the country which is what we call the Andes or the highlands. You know? In Spanish, we call it La Sierra, which covers about 30% of the whole country. So the Andes is basically a mountainous area dominated by the Andes, of course, where Mount Huascaran soars over 6,768 meters in elevation. This mountain, Huascaran, is located in, in the northern part of Peru and is the highest mountains in the tropics of the world, all right? And then we have the jungle, or La Selva, which covers about 60% of the whole Peruvian territory. This is a vast region of tropical vegetation in the Amazon River, basing to, no, um, home to Peru's largest nat natural reserves. Now we have to see here, and this is funny in Peru because being the jungle, the biggest area in Peru, the Amazon rainforest, the biggest area, is the least populated region also in the country, okay? Because the big uh, main cities in Peru are located along the coast of Peru, right? So here I can show you the main three regions, no, that we have in the country. So just going really quickly, folks, uh, Peru uh, offers, uh, yes, yes, uh, Charles. Yeah, let's let's just go to the the key birding sites in the Amazon. We can we can save northern Peru for another day, my friend. No, I I just gonna show you the map. You, 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 you go your All quick right. thing. Right. Okay. So, anyways, but we have uh, well three main routes: the northern, the mid, the center, and the southern. No, a route which uh, starts in Cusco, Manu, uh, Malaga, Pasa, Machu Picchu, and that's what um, we're gonna do now. We are going to develop this more. So um, to start a tour, we need to go to Cusco. 
Cusco is the first largest city in Peru. We have about 1 million inhabitants living here. It's also the old ancient capital of the Inca Empire. And it's the main game for Manu Biofair Reserve and Machu Picchu Sanctuary. So here we have a, a, a brief, no, I mean, the two maps of Peru uh, showing the location of Manu National Park and Machu Picchu area, no? They both located in southern eastern Peru, right? And well, this is uh, something that I, also, I always find interesting. Uh, and I would like to explain you quite uh, quickly. No? Um, here is a, a, a cut of the mountains of the Andes. And as uh, you can see, uh, for example, why we have, first of all, cloud forests on the eastern slope of the Andes. And on the western slope is all dry, no? Basically, it's all dry on the western slopes because of the Humboldt current that brings very cold water, all right, and creates and creates no foam or no clouds on the western slopes. But on the other side of the of the mountains, on the eastern slopes, where Cusco, Machu Picchu, and Mano, obviously, are located. It's very rich in vegetation, it's um, always raining, it's very, very wet. And here, you know, in this uh, sort of like drawing, uh, explain the reason why, no? Cusco City is like here in the middle. Here you can see some of the lodges located on, this, on the Andes and on the mountains, right? And what we're doing on this tour is we're going from Cusco, which is located at 3,400 meters in elevation, we go over the mountains, no, over the Andes here, and then we go down on the Manu Road, all the way to the Manu Lowlands, no, the Amazon rainforest. So we cover basically this uh, section of the eastern slopes of the Andes, which is first very wet, no, which is the cloud forest, and then the Amazon rainforest. No, Cusco is at 3,400 meters. Cock of the Road Lodge is uh, more or less 1,500 meters, Amazonia Lodge is at 800 meters, and Manu Wildlife Center is at 260 meters in elevation, more or less. All right, so remember the Andes here will be acting as a rain shadow for all the clouds that are coming from the east to the west that get stuck here and they're not able to go across. And that's why when they are here, they are loaded with water and then the rain will get released, forming all this very wet and humid, you know, habitat all the time, no? Anyways, um, so Manu, by Austria Reserve, some of the facts. Uh, Manu is the second largest national park in Peru. Uh, it covers streaming habitats, the Andean grassland of Puna, the cloud forest and the lowland Amazon rainforest. It has the best bird watching, bird watching road in the world where every 300 meters of road you get to see new species of flora and fauna. This is very special, by the way, very, very nice fat. It's home to 1,009 species of birds, more than all the birds in the US and Canada together. But not only that, we also have a world record in butterflies, as you can see, more than 1,200 species of butterflies, more than 200 species of mammals. Manu National Park is also very, very nice for mammals. We have 12 species of monkeys, you know, and we have uh, this jaguar as well, you know, you can see here. Um, we have a bunch of number of species of bats and, you know, rodents, capybaras. So it's a huge area, one of the richest, you know, uh, places in the world, you know, in terms of biodiversity. All right, so, on the way to Manu, this is some of the sceneries that we can see before we actually get into the birds, guys. Sorry, but a little bit of introduction. Um, as we leave, as we leave Cusco, as we depart Cusco, we're basically gonna go through some Puna habitat, as you can see here, number one. Then when we go over the mountains and we start going down the road to Manu Road. The first uh, sort of uh, forest that we get to see is the Elfin Forest. That is also known as Dwarf Forest, which is like um, the transition between the Andean grasslands and the cloud forest per se. And then we have the cloud forest, which is lower in elevation. You can see there is much more uh, trees, it's much more green, the trees are taller and bigger. And already down in the lowlands, we have um, 
you know, Oxbow Lakes, like this one here, where we always go. Uh, and then in the Amazon rainforest, as you can see here, we have canopy towers, which is also good for bird watching. All right. This is very much you no know, all the uh, habitats we get to see on the way to Manu. You no, know? we go through all these different nice little small regions. So here is where we everybody likes. You no, know? uh, we talk about birds now. So so so. When are we going to get to Wake Point? Is that come coming up, buddy? It's coming. It's coming. After this. All right. All right. All right. The thing is, as we as we we leave Cusco, and before I you get you. to and before you get to Waikecha, we go through some puna habitat as you can see, right. and we have some birds. Nice. We'll and then there's some birds we look for no, on this on this side of the mountains, and these are all endemics. Like for example, creamy crested spine tail is a Peruvian endemic. Bearded mountaineer, which is a hummingbird, is also endemic. Rusty fronted canastero and chestnut breasted mountain finch. These are the Peruvian endemic we always look for on this on this side of the mountains before we get to Huayquecha. All okay. right. And and how far and how far is it like Cusco to Huayquecha? Straight drive, no birdings about three four hours uh, right yeah it's about four hours it's about four hours okay. but of course about... we bird the whole way so yeah. the first day we take we 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 actually start the tour with what a couple hours of birding close to cusco at warpe lake right yeah there is a lego called wakarpa it's actually in this lake where you when you look for two of these four species no of, of endemics okay. And then we really forty minutes away from Cusco, no. And though and though it's a long drive, it it turns out to be like a, a lot of bird stops as we get to Waycoacha, right? Exactly, exactly. But okay, as I said, I because there's so many birds, I have choosing only the endemics we look for, no. But there's much right. more birds that we we always try right. to get, no. Um, well, so you know, uh, uh, very briefly, right? And these tours, we are uh, uh, we get a list of between 500 to 600 species of birds. We can get up to 18 species of Peruvian endemics. Uh, we look for the birds highly localized uh, species in southern eastern Peru and north of Bolivia. Um, we got all these cloud forest birds, especially the nice cloud forest tanayers. We have the Lake of Coco de Rol all year round, basically. And in the Manu lowlands, we have the best macaws and parroclalix in the world. And the Manu also, uh, in the Amazon part, we get all these bamboo birds, mixed feeding flock and canopy species. All right, this is what we always look for in these kind of tours uh, <clears throat> we, we do on Manu. So, well, Charles, this is Waikecha. We finally get there. Sorry, but there's so many things. No, 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 no. That's Peru fine. That's fine. Is, it just, it just to kind of give people a context. Jose Antonio started with a pretty broad introduction to the entire Manu Road, uh, Manu Biosphere air area that includes both the Manu Road bird watching, and then the the Amazon part. Um, but the first sort of major stop. Um, on the tour is Wequecha. And it's also called P E L E L E E P Pila Wata. Not that my yeah. Spanish slash <laughs> local language is worth any anything. But well, there they, you they, go, my friend. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they, but basically uh Waikecha is the name of the biology station, right? And the name of the area is Piaguata, right? And we are gotcha. here already on the eastern slope of the Andes at 3,000 meters in elevation. Waikecha is the highest biology station in the world at that, at that height. And here's a bunch of new birds, you know, that we, we should try to get, no? For example, red and white ampita, that is here, is the Peruvian endemic that lives in the grounds of uh, Waikecha biology station. It's always hard to get. Then we have the only species of mountain toucan in this part of Peru which is the great breasted mountain toucan, it's easy to see. Then we have all this bunch of uh, mountain tanayers, but I just choose in the hooded mountain tanayer to put it here because obviously it's a nice, beautiful species. 
and here is also a bar fruit eater country you know, that we, we look for. But as I said, no, it's not only that, there is a bunch of other birds that we always try to get. And we usually stay one night in there no, to get uh, most of the birds around. No? There's also Jungas pygmy owl, other species of mountain tanager, the scarlet belly mountain tanager, golden colored tanager, etc. No? Then after yeah. Waikecha. Okay, so so let's let's talk a little bit more about Waikecha. If you want to go back a slide. So in the Waikecha, like that first day, and then we really bird there the first morning. Like how many species do you usually get? Um, say the first day, the first day and a half of of the tour. Uh, including the species uh, from Cusco, you mean? Yes, sir. Oh, we're talking about about 60, 70 species. Yeah, so the first species. day, day and a half of the tour, look at about 60, 70 species. 70 species. And then I know you saw, you showed hooded mountain tanager here. How many like tanager species are you going to have in the bag after the first day and a half of the tour in the field? Uh, yeah, let's see, one, two, three, um, at least five, six species of uh, mountain tanagers. Uh, flower pierces okay. as well. Uh -huh. Flower pierces, okay. mountain tanagers, and all that. Some species of hummingbirds as well are there. How, 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 how many species of hummingbirds? One, two, three, at least five species <laughs> of hummingbirds. That okay. are, are and just the first that. little uh -huh. day and a half of bird, bird watching. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody got any other questions about, say, the Cusco to Wequecha or Wequecha? No. What's the temperature so, like during this time frame? Oh, it's, it's cold at night, all right? Usually this place, usually this place is very uh, cloudy, as you can see. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the temperature now will drop to uh, maybe six degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know. 60 degrees about low the, the low 40s at night yes yes but but during the day it warms up typically in the 60s for the most part the good thing about this place is that now it has a private bathrooms i mean private accommodation with private bathrooms with hot water running all the time yeah. so there's no really uh, uh worry about it no but you know peru is the country of all this all the seasons no, uh, so one day you can be cold, and the next day, but two hours later, it can be hot. No, so you got to be ready for very um, yeah. dramatic, dramatic changes in the weather, even in one day. You know, so be ready yeah. for everything. But, but, but here we are very high. Wequecha, and most of the Manu Road is that sort of typical mid elevation y weather like we get in 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 Ecuador, right yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay so mm -hmm. it's cold at night and in, in, in the days the highs are usually somewhere in the 60s which some days it gets a little warmer than that um remember it's three three thousand oh and i just wanted nine, to add nine thousand feet yes right and i just want to add one other thing about Wequecha, um in this pete Ilawata area when we started these tours over 20 years ago um, there used to be no no lodging for tour, tourists at all, so we had to camp or go all the way to the Cock of the Rock Lodge, which really didn't give us enough time to do the Pilawata area. And then about, what, 10, 15 years ago, Wequecha Research Station was there, but the lodging was like a research station. It wasn't, it was like two bunk houses, and even couples had to be in separate rooms. But now as the Wequecha Lodge, there's private rooms that, that are nice and with private bathrooms. So it's a much it's a much nicer place. It is a very eerie small lodge, so we do gotta watch room situations there to fit the whole group in. But we do try to again keep the group to to six to eight. I got nothing more. That was a good question. Any other questions out there? It's a uh, child. Remember, it's a biology station, so they get students from all of the all, all over the world, no? And sometimes oh, we, so. yeah, sometimes we we see them there, but we never mixed up, no? Only uh, yeah, the meals, 
Paris is a nice, it's a nice place, you know, it's very high, as you can see, sure. it's an elfin, elfin forest. So the view that you can get at this place, especially in the morning, is really spectacular. All right? Oh, I got you. Nice so place. we're going Cusco down to Huequecha. And then yeah. farther down the road is and then Taco farther Rock down, Lodge. Yeah. Farther down the road is Coco de Rock Lodge, where the weather is more tropical, it's hotter. We are talking about 1,500 meters in elevation, which is about 5,000 feet, all right? And here, again, no, it's a place which is, uh, where there's a lot of birds. No, it was uh, hard for me to choose no, <laughs> the birds to show you and don't go to, and don't be too long in the expo uh, this exposition. But uh, obviously the name of the lodge is after the Andean cock of the rock, not far from the lodge, uh, going up the road about, I would say 10 minutes, 10 minutes by car. We have this nice lake of Andean cock of the rock where uh, it's actually active very much all year round, which is nice and it's good for tourism. Um, the birds are not far, the birds are a lot used to people. There is a little platform there, well covered platform. And um, you can to get you can go and see it like in the morning or late in the afternoon. They do this uh, lick two times a day, and um, I have seen up to twelve males cock of the rock. They're dancing, you know, when it's the right time of the year, and um, <clears throat> which again, you know, is like uh, I would say August and September. Um, well, they um, they brief between. Uh, September to December, very much in this, all these four months of the year, you can see a very, very good activity on the lake. But the other months of the year is also good to see that you see the male, alpha male there, you know, lekking or dancing, which is good. Anyways, so Andean Coco the Rock guarantee, no, at um, this spot, at this place. Then we have things like Versicolor Barbet, of course, it's not endemic. A species, but it's highly localized in southern eastern Peru, and it's also found in Bolivia, no, in northern of Bolivia. But in this area around the lodge, we can be easily find it, no, or found. Sorry. Then we have another endemic, Peruvian endemic, which is this little guy here. Is the cerulean cap mannequin. Cerulean man, uh, ma, uh, cap mannequin uh, is usually um, found uh, not far from the kitchen, actually, of the lodge. Um, it's a, um, it actually lakes around there. And again, no, you can see it almost all year round. So it's, it's very good spot to find that cerulean cap mannequin. In my personal experience, this is uh, the more reliable place to see it, you know, other than that, it's very hard to get this little mannequin. Another Peruvian yeah, endemic, and, yes. Yeah, and you know, and from Cock of the Rock, there's not just birding around the lodge. There's several uh, birding routes you take from the Cock of the Rock Lodge, and we typically spend three three nights there, or four four and four nights there. Three nights. So we typically spend three nights at the Cock of the Rock. So, you know, afternoon arrival birding two full days of birding um and then and then a final morning before we go farther down the road how now on those two full days of birding how much of that is within say an hour of the lodge and i know there's one site that's a little farther away that's like a up the mountain kind of road thing right yeah yeah you definitely have to move with the car a little uh, one day we will go from Cocodro Lodge up the up the road, maybe to reach an elevation of 7,000 feet or 2,500 mm -hmm. meters, which is a place called Rocotal, where you okay. get to see other species of birds. You no, know? and then you can easily spend the whole day up there, maybe uh, take your box lunch and spend the whole day, you no, know, birding there. You can even go a little bit farther and get closer to and get closer to, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Waikecha, no? Um, it's only, I would say, 25 kilometers, no, from one place to another. But uh, because the road is, you know, all uh, windy and zigzag, it will take a long time to get there. But you can get farther one day, farther up the road, I mean, 
and get some species of birds found up no, on the road. And then the second day you can go down the road uh, to get maybe an elevation of 1,000 meters, 3,000 feet or so, where you will start looking at new species of birds. So you got two full days where one day you go up the road and the second day you go down the road, but not very far down because the day you're leaving the lodge, you're gonna go down the road all the way to Amazonia. So you're gonna get to past the areas that you have been birding one day before, you understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so over the two days, you cover about 2,000, 2,500 feet in elevation from yes. the lowest point to the highest point? I would say so, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the typical drive is really not that far because you're going, you know, if like if you drove it end to end, it wouldn't be that far. But but because we're bird watching and we're stopping to bird all the time, you know, it's it can't be more than an hour one way or an hour the other, or more like two hours one way and an hour the other. Maybe two hours one day going up the road okay. and one hour going yep. down. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, I'm I gotcha. Can I, I ask gotcha. a question? Yes. yes, please. Jose, or um, how much walking up and down these mountains is involved? Uh, that's a good question. You see, I like always walking downhill. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> I don't like walking uphill. So right. the, it, it depends on the activity really. Because the manual road is so long, I will say. Normally what I do is I have some uh, specific spots where I always stop because I know there are birds there, highly localized birds, and the walking is not very far. Maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, but going downhill, all right? Expecting yeah. and looking for these birds. But then as we're going in the car, I always very... Um, I always watching and always listening in yeah. case they find, for example, a mixed feeding flock or a bird that is perched on a tree or on a branch. I will make a stop. Everybody get out of the car and we do the birding just in that in that little spot, looking at all these birds in case it's this a mixed flock, for example. Yeah. But um, but no, not so much walking. Uh, plus, remember the car, the vehicle is always next to us. For example, when there are people that are tired and they don't want to do birding anymore, they can always go back to the car and be sitting there and waiting, no? No problem. And um, it, it depends, but you know, walking is always downhill and I always try to uh, make it no more than half an hour or 45 minutes, you know, in each location where it stop. So we don't walk okay. back up that hill? No, it's down, down, downhill and up the hill we do it with the car. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then, and then the other bit too is um, you mentioned feeding flocks. Um, if people haven't done a lot of South American birding before, um, like your typical feeding flock along the Manu Road, you're getting 15, 20 different species in a feeding flock. It's more than just individuals. There's a lot of different species in the flock, right? Sorry, Charles, I didn't get you because for some... <laughs> kind of a silly question, but I'll say it again. Um, so um, a lot of people may not be familiar with, with feeding flocks in South of May, er Erica. How many typical different species do you get in a, fee in a, in a good size feed eating flock? In the cloud forest, because you see yeah. there are cloud forest meat flocks and they are Amazonian lowland meat flocks. In the cloud forest Oh, flocks, yeah, let's talk about that. Get, we, we get about oh, 20 species, 25 species uh -huh. of tanayers, yeah. for example. Yeah. yeah, yeah, 20, 25 species. And of course, most people don't get to see all the, all the birds. Né? That's why I am there, to try to show the birds to every single tourist. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but normally people get to see very good between eight to 10 species, a dozen of the species né? when a big flock yeah. is coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just I just want to clarify with folks kind of what what that's about. Um, you, the first time you see a feeding flock in the cloud forest in in South America, you know you freak out because you see you know all these light birds and a single flock of birds. Um, and what he's trying to say is, look, he's trying to show you the birds that you won't see 
the rest of the tour. <laughs> so he's kind of sorting the flock and getting the birders on those birds that we probably won't see the rest rest of the tour. And then as time allows, you will see all 25 of those tank managers, but you know, it's going to take a couple hits and, and some lodges will always talk about their great feeding flocks as if they only occur there, but there are great, huge, like, like, like you said, 20, 25 species of uh, beautiful birds in these feet eating flocks throughout the cloud forest of South America. So on a typical trip, Jose Antonio, for our typical route, how many feeding flocks do you typically bump in into over the full 15 days? Oh, I mean, I can get flocks almost typically. every, almost every, one, at least one flock every day. Yeah, 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 yeah. At least, yeah. Exactly. And in the yeah, in and the, then I'm, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and then I'm curious. Um, you mentioned that the the Amazon feeding flocks are a lot different. I've never observed that, but I think it's because I'm not paying attention. Are are there just less species in those feed eating flocks, or how are they different? No, uh, for example, there was there was a study uh, about this. Uh, Amazon mm -hmm. having feeling flocks and the, the person who studied the birds saw 102 species of birds all together at once. This oh is my a God. Su mega, super, super mega big feeding flocks, you know, because what happened in the Amazon rainforest is different. You get the canopy mixed flocks and the understory mixed feeding flocks. And sometimes they come together. And that's when you get to see a whole bunch of, woof, it's just amazing. But in, Holy uh, moly. Yeah, in a regular tour, it's difficult because you have to be there in the right time, in the right, in the right time, in the right location. And normally, you are on a lake, or in a canopy tower, or in a in a macaw clay lake. And um, you know, forest burning is always difficult. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen, to... I've seen the feeding flock, um, sort of not really in the cloud forest habitat, but somewhere between there, but not quite down in the Amazon basin. And it, I mean, we identified like 80 different species over a three hour time frame, And we yes. maybe walked, maybe walked a hundred yards to follow that flock. And it was like that multi-layer thing. I truly, I wasn't paying attention to, um, you know, how that was different from what I had seen, you know, several days before. Um, wow. And you hit like a flock like that in, in the Amazon every day or maybe no, not so No, no, no. I mean, we, we get, we, we hit Nick flocks in the Amazon every day, but not with that many species, no. Okay. I mean, right, right. And even yeah. if you just see the understory ones, you may not see the ones way, 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 way up high. Exactly, because it's, it's difficult anyways. I mean, but yeah, I mean, it, it was here in Manu National Park where people have studied this mixed feeding flock for the first time. Uh, it was right. Char Charles Mann back in the 90s who studied these birds. And he's the guy who told me that he was able to spot and recognize up to 102 species of birds in one mega flock that he called. I mean, it's not right, always, but, but no, it's not right. always like that. But he told right. me that it's when a canopy flock meets the understory flock, no? Gotcha, gotcha. So, Jose... Hello, and... Yes, yes. So, Jose, without looking at 102 species as the exception, <laughs> what, what would we see in the understory typically? Of the cloud forest or from the, on the Amazon? Amazon. Oh, we are going to get there, but typically we get things like um, ant birds, you no, know, ant strikes, ant wrens. We get things like trogons, um, things like wood creepers, you no. Know? Uh, yeah, basically. So how many different oh, species? I will talk. I will say maybe thirty, forty. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, and truly, I, I, uh, sorry about the side discussion there on feeding flocks, but I didn't realize there was such a contrasting difference between the cloud foot wars and the uh, Amazon lowlands. That's pretty incredible. Any, any other questions about Cock of the Rock Lodge, folks? 
at all. And, and you know, text... oh, and, I, and there's one question I have to backtrack on too that we got text, text, texted. Mm-hmm. So I have some a somebody, some That's... somebody asked if um, the biologic station at Wequetia was associated with the university. Uh, no, uh, by Waikicha is associated with a non-profit organization that is based in the States, actually, called ACA, A-C-A. No, uh -huh. the, the ACA, which, is, which means Association for Conservation of the Amazon or something like that. Yeah, okay. I mean, you, 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 know, you know Laura, Charles. You remember we did a fun trip a few years ago? And yeah, they yeah. Are the, they, they are they're the ones who organize the trip. Remember? I got gotcha. you. Yeah, ACA, yeah, yeah. ACA. Um, okay. Uh, and but, but basically, ornithological research archers from around the world can talk, contact ACA, and students mostly go oh there and do research. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, exactly. Okay, exactly. I got gotcha. you. I hope that covered that question that came from uh, Terry. Um, any other questions at all, folks? I, I do have one more question about the cock of the rock. Yes. I, got a, I got a little lost about when it's best to see it. I think you said September through December, but is it still seeable in the, the other months? Yes, yes, they, they are. In fact, um, they had no, there had been no tour that I haven't seen the, 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 the bird over all these 15 years I've been working there. Any, at any time of the year, you get to see them. But maybe in months that are no September to December, the activity at the lake is less. You understand? Oh, but you less. Get, okay, yeah, less. less. Because yeah, it's so, not the so, mating season. The mating season here for Cocoa the Rocks goes from September to December, right? Uh -huh. That's where you get to see a lot of good activity on the lake. I mean, the birds dancing and all that. The other months, it's not the mating season, but the males always come to the lakes, you know, and do a little bit of a dance just to make sure the females will look at them. Oh. So there's always activity. Okay. And I generally have one other question. How many other mannequins on this in 15 days would we see? Aha, uh -huh, that's a good question. Mannequins. I Let's love see. mannequins. Yeah, uh, hold on, maybe one, two, three, about five, six species, I would oh, say. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Uh-huh. Great, I'm yeah, done. Yeah, I mean, Sri Lanka. All okay. right. Any, any other questions out there, folks? Yeah, five, it's not... Six species, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I have anything else on Crocker Rock. Oh, how many total species do you add to the tour? And the sort of, uh, call it, you know, an afternoon of birding, two full days of birding, and a final morning of birding at uh, ah, Cock of the Rock the time, Lodge. By the time we leave yeah. the lodge, we should be already by five, 150 species of birds. Easy. Okay. Probably, so 60, probably, 70 the first day, and then we add about 80, 80, 80 ish from the Cock of the Rock area. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, because the lodge right. also has a very beautiful garden with a lot of hummingbird feeders. All right, so in these uh, feeders, there's a bunch of new species of uh, hummingbirds that can and feed on, no? And sometimes you get to yeah. see also the uh, meat flows coming through just by the uh, dining room of the lodge, all right? Great. Anything else you would like to add on the top of the Rock Lodge, sir? No, no, I don't think so. The lodge is very good. It uh, has also private bathrooms, as you can see, hot water running all the time. So it's very nice, very um, comfortable, very good food, eh? by the way, very good food, very good lodge in there. And here we're about 160 kilometers already away from Cusco. All right. And this area is known as San Pedro. Right. Let's see. Next, next place. What happened here? Okay. It's Amazonia Lodge. Uh, that, as you know, Charles, we go there as well, right? Um, Amazonia, yeah, Amazonia Lodge is located between um, 
600 to 800 meters in elevation, that is about between 2,000 to 2,500 feet, is already at the base of the mountains, an area known as foothills, all right? This is a very good location because it is an, it is in an area where there is a still song mountain species of bird, and you already get to see some lowland Amazonian species, all right? It's right there in the middle. In Peru, right, and in most of South America, anyway, areas with most species of birds are located at the base of the mountains, all right? Right at the foothills, as we call it. So this was an old hacienda, an old ranch, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, people used to grow a lot of coca, right? Uh, there were a lot of coca plantations, a lot of tea plantations also around there. So because of all these plantations, the area around the lodge is very good and very open, right? And it's actually um, very nice for bird watching. There's also a bunch of feeders as well, especially to attract hummingbirds. And in this lodge, all right, again, is a lot of species around here, guys. But I have chosen maybe these species here that are, well, the Kepkets hermit is endemic, no a species of, of, of hummingbird that comes to the feeder sometimes, not all the times, but comes. And um, the Rufus crested coquette is a tiny little hummingbird with a fantastic crest, as you can see in the picture, that also comes and is very common at here in the grounds of the lodge coming to the feeders. At nights, we always hear the Tony Bell screech owl, you know, uh, or the Eastern Tony Bell screech owl, how we call it now. This species, they're in the garden of the lodge, always calling, and we get to, we get out and we find it pretty much all the time. And another nice uh, bird, although it's not endemic, but is uh, uh, highly localized in the southern eastern Peru is the scarlet hooded barbet. Well, among other, the list for Amazonian lodge is over 300 species of birds. No, probably, in fact, I think it's more than 400 species of birds. Um, that, that is the whole list of birds for the lodge. No, uh, the lodge is, as I said, uh, is on secondary forest, an area that has been cut before for the plantation, but it also goes into um, uh, some mountains that are not far from the lodge that um, actually gets you into nice primer forest. They have a nice canopy tower where you can also go very early and look at the birds from there, no? Another bird that is quite, um, a, a quite common to see around here is military macaws, no? Ma the only species of macaws found in the mountain that are often seen around Amazonia Lodge. Very good food, nice, uh, friendly people around this place. And as you can see in the picture, they have like a veranda, no? Where they have these nice, uh, comfy benches where you, and the rooms are back in there, where you can just get out of your rooms and be on the veranda and look at all the hummingbirds coming to the feeders, no? Or if you are tired, you can always sit down there and keep looking at the birds. Birding here never stops. It's really, really good. All right. So this is a, a very special location. It was first described it, um, as a good birding place for um, John Fields Patrick. All right. Back like in the 80s, when he came down the road for the first time and he was looking for accommodation to stay for the night. And people, you know, recommended him to go to this hacienda, this ranch, no? He was supposed to stay there for only a couple of nights, and he ended up staying there for three months, you know, counting all the birds around this hacienda. So he counted more than, I think, 300 species of birds, and then he promised the owners back in the time that he was going to bring jury, uh, birding, birders or bird watchers into this place. So this place became very famous back in the 80s and 90s, and it still is to be honest, uh, although, uh, right. well, the people who now owns the lodge have changed a little, but it's still excellent for birding, no, Charles? Right, right. and the key habitat, I mean, it's kind of right there on the, what's the name of the river? Um, oh, the Upper Madre de Dios River. Yeah, so the, the upper, yeah. Madre, Madre, so, and, Madre de Dios, Mother of God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mother of the D. 
Yes. So that river feeds in that part of the Amazon basin. So though as you're just on the edge of the Amazon basin, um, you're still getting forest foothills birding there. That's why it's so sweet. Yes. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, and then typically by the time, and we spend what, four nights there or three, three nights there? Uh, we've been spending three or four nights there. Three nights, Charles, no four. Yeah, no four yeah, anymore. yeah. Right, okay. And then, um, and uh, by the time we leave, leave there, our trip list is already 300 species? Uh, kind of, yeah. It should be over Getting 300 close species. to 300. No, yeah, it yeah. should be over Getting... 300 species by the time we okay. leave there. Yes. Okay, okay. So a good, the good, the first, what is that? Four or five, the first eight. Counting Cusco, the first nine nights of the tour, we're already at three, 300 species, and there you go. Mm -hmm. um, we're running a little short of time. We'll take a couple questions. Any questions anybody has about uh, the Amazonia area? I just, I have a quick question just about yeah. bird guides. Um, is there a specific bird guide that is best to prepare in advance for the birds I would see there? So um, yeah. she's, she's asking about a field, a written field, field guide. Um, yes, of course. Uh, we have the Bird of Peru book. If you give me one second, I will bring it and i show you. To yeah, you. I was about to grab mine, mine too. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll grab mine and you can go ahead and start talking about Manu since we're kind of short on time. Any any other quick questions on wait on uh, Amazonia Lodge before we jump? And I will go get the field gut guide. It is it is on my bookshelf here, very close. Um, and I'll I'll just yeah. put it out there. You, okay, you beat no, me so, to do it, buddy. So I will start talking about Manu Wildlife Center, Charles. Yes, please, please, because we got we're we're right. a little long so, on time. Yeah. Manu, yeah. Ma Manu Wildlife Center is the lodge. It's you know it's supposed to be the best the best birding lodge in the Amazon in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. All right. It's at Manu Wildlife Center, located at 260 meters in elevation, more or less nearly 1,000 feet, already very low. You know, just remember where we started. We started way up high in the mountains where, as you can see, it's a very nice, comfortable lodge. And here is where we get to see, to see things like the Macaw clay lakes, you know, the nice oxbow lakes, the canopy towers. Then we have a huge, big uh, bamboo forest there with a bunch of uh, bamboo birds or bamboo spe specialties. And then we have the mega mixed feeding flocks, you know, what I was talking about already. So this is a place where we can easily spend five nights or maybe six nights, all right? Easily, no problem. Every day there is something new to see every day. We also have here um, a, a tapir clay leak, which is a, a place at night only where tapirs, you know, the second, okay. the second biggest terrestrial mammal in South America go and eat clay, right? That we can go and visit. We have a couple of canopy towers that we can go almost every night, per, sorry, every day, every morning, and a bunch of things to do, no? Here is where you get all these uh, ant birds, ant wrens, ant shrikes, no? Things like harpy eagle, gray putu, a bunch of new species of hummingbirds, and the famous macaw clay leaks. Uh, the macaw clay leaks were first studied in southern eastern Peru, in Manu, really, in this area. So the macaw clay leaks we're going to see is the one that biologists study for the first time ever. The one that was featured in the National Geographic magazine of January 1994, all right? So there is a huge platform that can hold up to maybe 60 people, easy, maybe 70 people, in front of the McCall Clay League, in front of the Clay League. It's a very well-covered platform, you know, that is on stilts, about maybe I would say five meters above the ground or 15, 18 feet above the ground. And it has nice, comfortable chairs. And what we do is we take breakfast to this place. Um, we get there very early in the morning. We put up breakfast and then looking over the huge uh, open area of the blind, we get to see the macaws and the parrots coming to eat clay. No, this is why 
and our Peruvian Amazon rainforest is famous for, no, the clay lakes. But as I said, almost every day there are things to do because the lodge itself, which is on a 400, uh, 400 uh, yes, no, sorry, 400 hectares, uh, also uh, covers a lot of small habitats. Close to the lodge, as I said, we have a big patch of bamboo. Then we have also what we call semi-flooded forests. Then we have high um, uh, terra firme forests, right? And then we have two Oxbow lakes and the clay lakes. And then we also get to see a lot of um, river birds because we go up and down the rivers many times in order to get to the Oxbow lakes and the Macaw clay lakes. So we get to see a bunch of birds like egrets and herons, you know, everything is in there. So we get in these tours with Charles, we get five nights in this place. Yeah, and just so folks know, I mean, again, a lot of our ed editors took the Manu Lodge off their Manu trip, um, which just blows me away because it is pretty birding rich. And typically in five nights, call it really five slash six, six days of birding, um, how many species do you add to the tour? Tour, tour there, 100, 150, 50? Okay, yeah, it's about 150, 160 species, yeah. yeah if you are really lucky, if you are really lucky, you can get up to maybe a couple hundred species there. Hello? Right. And, and Hello? I've, got a, I've got a controversial yeah. question, but I actually don't know the answer. Um, Someone asked if these lodges have stayed open during the pandemic, and I assume they've just closed, right? No, they are closed. They are closed. Yeah. There is no, yes. and so they're there closed. Is, there is no way you can get there now. I mean, the yeah. borders, the borders of the the provinces here are closed in Cusco. You can't even leave the city. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and. Um, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of other good quests, 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 questions, but we are running short on time. Some Somebody asked if, if uh, we offer an extension to uh, to uh, Machu Picchu, and we do. And actually, if you check out our website, www.pibird.com, um, and navigate to our Peru birding trips, there's you'll see that there's really three. <clears throat> there's Northern Peru, which he alluded to, there's this um, Manu biosphere trip. And then the natural extension to the Manu biosphere trip is Machu Picchu because um, this tour starts in Cusco, ends in Cusco, and we often do Machu Picchu as a post tour, but we've done it as a free tour before as well. And unfortunately, we're going to have to talk more about Machu Picchu birding um, yeah, we're going to have to talk more about Machu Picchu birding on our next video presentation, which, you know, it'll be a short one, but a good one. Um, so, uh, um, and just to be clear, and we'll just do some highlights on Machu Picchu bir birding. Um, well, I guess we have this nice slide here. So that's a picture of the World Heritage Sites. Um, how many bird species? There's 420 species of birds in the area, and, and it also includes the sacred alley right above Cusco, or is that right below? That's right, right below Cusco, right? It's below Cusco. It's, a, it's lower in elevation. Yeah, yeah. 2,400. Right. So meters. the thing, the thing that confuses folks is like Machu Picchu is downhill from Cusco, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the lower elevation. So after we do that Manu Road loop and we go to the Amazon, we end up in a town called the Maldana Auto. And then we fly to Cusco. And then, much to everybody's surprise, you take the train to Machu Picchu, but it's downhill. I mean, it's the train is kind of uphill, but at the end of the day, Machu Picchu is at a lower elevation than Cusco, right? Exactly. I mean, okay. here is a yeah, map, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can see. I mean, there is a, the green area on the right is Manu National Park. Okay. So I, I, have, in, I have put in circle the, what we, where we're going after Manu, no? Cusco is here. We're going to Machu Picchu, which is northwest of Cusco. 
So it's yeah. Abra Malaga, no Malaga Pass. That's a, that will be the extension for the tour, Charles. No, so exactly. The, you exactly. you to, you take the train here where it says Oyaltaytambo here, Oyaltaytambo. Yeah. You take the train to Machu Picchu. So from Cusco to Oyaltaytambo is about a couple of hours, and then from here right. you you go by train to Machu Picchu, which is another hour and a half, more or less. So it's not really that far, no, not really that. I mean, long. So you right, get but there. Road, road wise, the only real transportation there is by foot or by train, right? Yes, because you you do the Inca Trail, <laughs> no, the famous Inca Trail, four days, three nights, when you walk over the mountains for twenty six miles to right, get to right. Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. Right, and to be clear, most younger people do that. Most bird bird watchers. Um, take the train up, and then yeah, yeah. There, there is no point to do the Inca Trail and do birding because you are more focusing yeah. in walking really than in bird watching yeah. because it's quite hard walk. It's not an easy walk. Yeah. So, so we've whetted some appetites on Machu Picchu, and I think we covered the question. And truly, of all the tours we run on the Manu Ba Ayotzin. Um, I would say half of everybody booking the tour wants to do the Machu Picchu E2 extension. Um, and again, the two tours combined is about 600 bird species. Um, any other questions? And I'm going to take care of some administrative yeah. matters. Any other yeah. questions from yeah. out, out there? Yeah. I have Shoot. a question. I saw uh, on the other slide 423 species with Machu Picchu. So is that uh how how do you get that in such a small place it looks like there's no birds no no there is a lot of birds this is cloud forest machu picchu actually the site the city of machu picchu is located up in the top of the mountain as you can see this you know, right, the, this right. building is in the top of a mountain right and this all this mountain down below is surrounded by a beautiful and very pristine cloud forest so you can walk up there and see a lot of birds. There is down, you know, at the base of this mountain, there is a, there is a town called Aguas Calientes, which means hot springs. Yeah. And that's where you get to stay for a night because all the hotels and restaurants are down there. So it's about half an hour by bus. So all this hot spring town, or Aguas Calientes, is all surrounded by cloud forest. So there is, uh, and there is some nice spots that I know where you can go and and see all, not the 423 species, but see a bunch of uh, nice birds that do you, you don't get to see in Manu National Park. No, the 423 species are the in the whole sanctuary of Machu Picchu, which is 32,600 hectares, no? And you never get to cover all that in such a short time, no? That is the yeah. whole number of birds found in there. But we normally get there and we add to our manu list, maybe what, another 80 species, new ones for the tour, probably, including some, including some endemics that I think I, I have it here. Look, like the Inca. Yeah, yeah but we'll, but we'll, we'll talk yeah. about that on another trip, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. um, no just time. a couple administrative ma ma matters. Um, we, 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 if anybody doesn't want their questions to be recorded or their voice to be recorded, generally, I don't think we've identified anybody by first and last, last name. But if you don't want us to put this up on YouTube for privacy reasons, please email operations at pibird.com and we will respect that. Um, again, if you have any privacy concerns, just email them to operations at pibird.com. Um, two, we're probably going to do another couple Peru birding calls in the next six or eight months. Um, eventually, I think the pandemic is going to be over and Jose and Tony is going to be busy in the field. Um, and he does do crazy, crazy back, back to back trips, typically from about, um, somewhere in May, June through October, and he's pretty bit busy. And then, believe me, as soon as he gets home, he's pushing me to get more bookings for Orem for January, February, March. I mean, he is the hardest working guide. He really is. He's one of the hardest working guides. 
um, around. Um, and then um, truly more on our website at www.pivert.com. And uh, we will, we are going to start to follow up these trip reports with field guides lists and trip reports and more information. Uh, truly, we had no idea how popular these things were going to be, and we'll hope to do more. Um, any other final questions before we sign off? Hearing, hearing none, thank you all for your time. Oh, wait. Yes. Oh, somebody asked me, do I have the field book? I have three copies of the field book in my office somewhere, um, and I cannot find them. Do, do you have a copy of the field guide handy, buddy? Jose, I, I, Jose, I, I Jose got and, it. Yeah, give me one second. Okay, one second. He, he's going to put it up on, on the screen. Yeah, I looked all over the house. I truly, I did a northern Peru trip two or three years ago, and I think I'm still compiling my list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I think it's in a box someplace. But I got like a free copy from the Peru government. I got another copy, and then so I've, here it is: Birds of Peru. And who are the? And it's it's Princeton University Press, Birds of Peru. And um, just read the first author there. Exactly. Just write the title because we can barely read it there. Yeah. So it's the the title. Of the field guide is Birds of Peru. Who's who's the first author? Jose Antonio. I think it's Fanshawe. Who's, who's the first author of the field guide? Thomas Schoenberg. So it's the 2010 is the most recent? Thomas um, Schoenberg. Oh, shoot. Yeah, shoot. Uhlenberg is the first author. It's readily available on Amazon. And um, truly, every three to five years, there's a new edition. Um, so I, I think it's... it's the latest, I don't know when the latest edition is, but if you go to uh, Amazon.com, you'll have it. Yes, sir. Charles, there is also the app. So, you know, there is the app that you can oh. buy for people who are more into the technology. The app of yeah. Birds of Peru. There you go. Okay. And you can get the app as well. And there you go. I have to say, I like to have both when I'm in the field. Because um, what any other... is that they, they keep updating the app, you know? So if there is a right. new species of bird that has been recently reported in Peru or something, they would put it on the app. You see? Okay, yep, thank yep, you. Yep. And they keep it yep. updating it all the time, which is good, you know? Because a book, yep. you have to wait until a new edition to re be released, and then you buy it. But you get the app, I think, costs $42, just like the book, really. Then you get the updating all the time, and then you can look for the species of birds. And there's nice maps as well. For example, here you can see you know, the map of where the bird is located. You no, know? oh, and it's very it? good. Yep. You see? Well, we just got. Well, I, yep. Nice. Well, um, again, any any other questions at all? I'm gonna check the chat box. Um, I think we got it. Um. I, I truly, we look forward to getting feedback from all, all of you all on, on the conferences as well. Do check out our website, www.pibird.com. We will hope the pandemic continues to slow down or starts to slow down significantly um, in the months ahead, and hopefully we'll get a vaccine here and we'll all be able to do some birding um, in the Peru birding season. Hopefully, I would hope by July, August next year. Um, any other questions, folks? If not, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank so you much. all. Thank and you. I apologize Thank for uh, uh, cutting it short. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank bye bye, you all. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye, bye Jose. Hope, hope to see you in Peru sometime soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Please, please come. I'd love to. We need you.